Uh, Rahim. Uh, today we're going to talk about the management of cerebral palsy, a rapid and brief idea about what you sh should know about cerebral palsy. First, is cerebral palsy equivalent to mental retardation? Is it a clinical diagnosis? Is it a progressive disease or a stationary disease? Different classification, and of course, we're gonna discuss different orthopedic operations used in cerebral palsy children. First, Cerebral palsy is a perinatal brain insult. It occurs due to either injury or insult to the brain during pregnancy, during labor, or in the first two or three years after labor. The immature brain is affected, where the motor area is partially damaged. This causes destruction of the normal motor development, and it may be associated with other problems. Literally, cerebral palsy is palsy of the limbs due to brain insult. It has got nothing to do with mental retardation. You should know that cerebral palsy is not equivalent or has got nothing to do with mental retardation. Only very rarely CP children are mentally retarded. CP is a pure clinical diagnosis. It may be confirmed by MRI, but however, you should know that MRI needs anesthesia in children. That's why it's not commonly used the size of the brain or the size of the brain lesion does not correlate with the motor of level deficits. Nerve conduction tests is not needed. Metabolic labs is only needed when you suspect a metabolic error or metabolic disease. Classification of cerebral palsy is either neurological, which is subdivided into spastic CP, which constitutes two thirds of the cases, and other types, the aphetotic, the ataxic, or the mixed types. Topographically, the CP spastic children are further subdivided into monoplegic, diplegic, hemiplegic, quadriplegic, or total body affection. What you should know about the pathology of cerebral palsy, we have the pathology in the brain, which is stationary. Here we have the cerebral insult occurs in the perinatal time. Some brain cells are damaged. This is stationary and it never increases. However, the pathology in the limbs is progressive. Why? We have the primary pathology in the brain where the motor area 4 is affected. This leads to the spasticity in the limbs, weakness. As I said, this is the cornerstone of the cerebral palsy. Literally, palsy, cerebral palsy means weakness in the limbs to you to cerebral insult and the lack of motor control or the lack of the selective motor control. The secondary pathology occurs in the limbs. We have a fact that says that bones grow more fast than the spastic muscles. By time, we have more shortening of the muscular units and more contractures. This leads to either bony deformities or persistence of some deformities like the coxa valga or the excessive femoral antiversion, which is the persistence of the neonatal position. By time, the muscle contracture and shortening together with the bony deformities leads to joint subluxation, like what happens in the hip, or flexion on the knee, or sometimes we have dislocation or scoliosis. The functional classification of the cerebral palsy is the most commonly used is the gross motor function classification. It's subdivided into two major subtypes, the ambulatory, which is the level one, two, or three, where level one, the child can walk and run normally, but he has very mild limitation. The level two usually uses some aids during the, to be able to walk, while level three should use a walker or something like this. And these three types are constitute two thirds of the cases. The non-ambulatory, which constitute one third of the cases, is either level three, level four or five, where they usually use a wheelchair Sometimes he can walk in the indoors. This is the level four. Level five is completely wheelchair dependent.
to manage or the cerebral palsy child, we should know the priorities of what the CP children needs. Uh, the fact that most of the parents, when we ask them, what do you need for your child? They ask for walking and then walking in a better position and then walking better and better. Concerning what the child needs, mainly he needs first the, to communicate well in the community, to be independent and do most of the daily activity without help. The third thing, they need to be mobile either with a wheelchair or to use a walker to walk. Lastly, to be ambulator. They never need the walking as the priority like the parents think. We should always try to convince the, children, the parents what the child needs, that communication and independence and mobility is more important than walking. To care for the CP child, you should have a multidisciplinary approach. The physiotherapist, the occupational therapist, the neurologists, the orthopedic surgeon, of course, plays a major role. Others may help, like the neurosurgeon or the pediatrician. Concerning our impact in the CP children, the surgical management, we should know what we, how can we help this child. We should work for correcting the deformities, improve the walking pattern, prevent bony deformities or joint dislocation, and of course, treat the bony deformity or joint dislocation if it already happens. The timing of surgery, usually we start the surgery by the age of five or six. However, if we have the hip at risk or hip subluxation or dislocation or a severe contraction preventing walking, we can go into very early in age. The types of surgeries, of course, is either soft tissue surgery where we do tendon lengthening, intramuscular recession, or tenotomies, or a bony surgery like we do something like an osteotomy at the hip or at the knee. The most common operation used in cerebral palsy is the single event multilevel surgery, where all the deforms should be addressed simultaneously. Most commonly, we do an iliopsoas tendon lengthening, adductor lengthening, medial hamstring lengthening, and tendoachylis lengthening. Of course, there is no one operation for all CP children. There is nothing standard in CP surgery. Every patient needs to have a, an operation tailored for what he needs. They can be done, the operation could, could be done either through an open technique or a percutaneous technique. However, you should know that the percutaneous technique needs to be done by a very well-trained surgical orthopedician and it needs long-lasting experience to do it percutaneously. Doing a multi-level release, you should focus on two things. Never to do a tendoachylis lengthening alone in the diplegic, which is a very common mistake. Also, there is no need to do a lateral hamstring release. You should always keep the biceps femoris without lengthening. A very important issue in CP hip surgery is to know the hip subluxation and dislocation. Is it something rare or something very common? and how to manage such a condition. First, you should know that hip subluxation is directly correlated with the level of the gross motor function classification. It's very common in the non-ambulatory and very rare in the ambulatory children. That's, it's very common in level five. It reached about 90% of children with level five GMF. They have hip problems. And in level one, it's very rare. The natural history says that if the my primary migration index is about 60, 70, it will progress to frank dislocation. Why the hip subluxates or dislocates in the CP? Why is it very common? It's not like the DDH. It's due to both soft tissue problem and bony problem. The soft tissue is mainly due to the hip adductor contracture, where we have very limited hip abduction, the iliopsoas and flexor tightness, causing, causing together with the hip adductor problem, the hip to go into subluxation and dislocation. This is the soft tissue problem. The bony problem is mainly due to persistence of the excessive femoral antiversion, persistence of the coxa valvia, together with the dysplasia or the increase in the estabular index. All of this leads to progressive migration of the head from the estabular going outwards, superiorly and posteriorly. By time, if the head is kept dislocated, degenerative 
changes occur, and this is the main cause of pain. This is the Rymer migration index where we have, we calculate the percentage of the head inside the acetabulum in relation to the whole physial space. It's subdivided either less than 33% where the head is located in the acetabulum. If it's more than 33%, it's subluxated. If it's more than 100%, it's frankly dislocated. Again, this is the primary migration index. Here you can see on the left side, you see the head here is contained. And on the other side, you see this is less than 33%. That's why we say this is a near normal hip. Hip subluxation occurs when we have the Rymer migration index less than 33%. If it's more than 33%, the hip is subluxed. We have disruption of the Shenton line. We have tight adductors and tight iliosaurus. And this needs a lengthening of the adductor and the iliosaurus. And if there is persistent subluxation, we should go for proximal femoral varus derotation osteotomy. If the Rymer margin index is more than 6%, and to go to a pelvic osteotomy, if you have severe acetabular dysplasia. When you have frank dislocation, here we have the Rymer variation index more than 100%. The hood is completely dislocated. We should go for soft tissue release. Again, the source and adductor lengthening plus bony varus derotation osteotomy plus minus femoral shortening. And of course, we should do a pelvic osteotomy. And if this problem is occurred to we, are, we have a late presenting CP neglected hip dislocation with arthritis, we should go for femoral head excision. Always you should remember that when you have a dislocation on one side, examine the other side. If you have a persistent abduction deformity, it should be corrected because it's the most common cause of recurrence of hip dislocation. When you have this side fixed in abduction, and you locate this side, you should go here to do abductor and flexor release to bring the femur into neutral position to prevent this side from going to redislocation. This is how the hip progresses if left untreated. This is a normal located and this is a subluxed. This is a dislocation and this is a neglected dislocation. How can we do a various derotation osteotomy? It's either done percutaneously using a monolateral fixator or done with a plate and screw fixation. In our reach center, we prefer to do it with a monolateral fixator. Here we can do a various derotation with this is the follow-up of the case, just you saw this after remodeling, and the head is well located. This is a case of neglected hip dislocation. It's a very terrible problem for the child. It, it's first diagnosed when the child stops eating. He has excessive seizures and com repeated convulsions. And this condition should be corrected. If you look at the other side, it's fixed in abduction. And that's why when you relocate this head, you should search of this side is having fixed abduction it should be corrected simultaneously with relocation of the neglected hip dislocation. Uh, please remember that physiotherapy has no role in preventing hip subluxation or dislocation. Spastic hips is very common, especially when you have gross motor function classification grade four or five. Hip surveillance is very important, you should do Follow up x rays every six months when you have an unambulatory child. Concerning the CP gait patterns, the true equinus is when you have only equinus of the foot. We have normal hip and knee. This is very rare in CP diplegics. The most common is the jumper gait where you have equinus deformity at the ankle, flexion knee, flexion and abduction at the hip.
The apparent equinus is the second most uncommon. The uh, crouch gait is a very tiring problem to children. Usually it's iatrogenic following excessive lengthening of the tendon acalis with short hamstring. This leads to severe dorsiflexion at the ankle, flexion at the knee, and flexion at the head. This is the true equinus. It's commonly seen in CP hemiplegics, but very rarely in CP diplegics. The jumper's gait, as I said, is the most common. It's, there is hip flexion, abduction, knee flexion, and ankle equinus. Early, it could be managed with buttocks, but in older children, they need the single event multi-level release. Commonly, we do a tendoacalus, hamstring, and abductor release, plus minus iliosoas release if there is hip subluxation. The crouch gait, as I said here, you have a hip flexion, knee flexion, and ankle dogs flexion. It's common in diplegics, especially if overlanding of the tendoacalus is done. To manage a crouch gait, you should focus on the knee. You should do proper knee extension through hamstring release. If still you have a fixed knee flexion deformity, you should do a supracondylar femoral osteotomy, which is either done percutaneously or open technique. Uh, you should have a good observation of the level of the patella. If the patella is very high, patella advancement procedure should be done. Uh, as I said, the supracondylar femoral osteotomy is mandatory to be done when you need, in the case of crouch gait, using either the open technique or a percutaneous technique. Please remember that there is absolute indication for early surgery when you have a hip problem. Hamstring in knee walkers in diplegics, tend to lengthening in hemiplegics. Always remember, isolated tendoacalus lengthening under the age of seven or eight can result in loss of ankle plantar flexion, and this results in the crouch gait. Thank you.